Hi, I'm Tori and Barbara. Welcome to today's Anaphylaxis Community Experts broadcast of Food Allergies and Anaphylaxis at School, Real World Solutions. This program is offered in partnership with the Allergy and Asthma Network, Millers of Asthmatics, and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Today's program is supported by Day Pharma. Food allergies and anaphylaxis are on the rise, as are debates about peanut-free schools, peanut-free baseball parks, and even peanut-free airplanes. But is it possible or medically effective to isolate food allergic children from killer proteins by placing them inside a bubble? To help steer this debate with realistic expectations and evidence-based solutions is today's moderator, Dr. Dana Wallace, president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Dana? Thank you, Torian. Good afternoon and welcome to Food Allergies and Anaphylaxis at School, Real World Solutions. Food allergies in schools are serious and unpredictable, but treatment is not. To help us shed light on real world solutions, please welcome our panel of experts. Dr. Jean Cash, Associate Professor of Psychology at the Center of Psychological Studies at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. Juanita Smith, an RN and Nurse Manager for the Chicago Public School System. Christy Adler, Principal at Laura B. Sprague Elementary School in Lincolnshire, Illinois. And Kristen Lerner, a CPA, but more relevant to today's show, a mom to children with food allergies. Let's start with a specific story from a mom. Tell us what happened when you found out your children had food allergies and how you felt. Well, I had been breastfeeding my daughter for six months and we were just starting to introduce solid food and I was trying to feed her yogurt and she got hives, a red rash around her mouth and I wondered what it was and when it happened again, Ultimately, we took her to the doctor, and they referred us to the allergist. They did testing, and they, and the doctor, I remember, quite nonchalantly was like, well, yeah, she's allergic to dairy and eggs and tree nuts, and you just got to avoid eating them. Make sure she just doesn't eat them. And I'm like, what? <laughs> then I'm thinking to myself, she can't eat them? Well, what are we going to feed her? Uh, and I had to go out. I had to learn how to read labels. I had to learn all the different words that they use for milk, especially for dairy products. And little by little, I learned what I could feed her. Everything that, that, that she ate was pretty much under my control. And even when she went to a friend's house, I would either send food with or I, I had talked to the parents ahead of time. But when you send them to school, suddenly there's this whole, it's a whole other world. And I remember when she started preschool at the parent meeting, raising my hand and saying, my daughter has a dairy allergy and would you please not send milk with your kids in their snack? And if you're gonna send something to eat that's for a treat for everyone, let me know what it is so that I can give my daughter something else. And all the moms just turning around and looking at me like I, like, like I had two heads, oh. what? Yeah. And I'm like, but she's allergic and I don't want anything to happen to her. And, and um, it, I had a lot of anxiety sending her to school. It's a lot less now because she's nine, she can read, for her, read labels for herself and, um, and I've been dealing with it for so long now. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it now, but it was really hard to send her to school initially. Juanita, tell us a little bit about how allergies and epinephrine are handled in the Chicago school system. Well, currently, we have a form that we're using to, for early identification of students with food allergic um, reactions or allergens. And we ask that the parent and the physician collaborate to complete this form and return it to the school nurse mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Once it's returned to the school nurse, their a core team is to meet and develop a plan for the student. And this uh, team is can include, but is not limited, to the school nurse, the school psychologist, the social worker, the principal of the school, the child's um, teacher, and of course the parent. Uh, once those, that team meets and then they would better identify the needs of the child and what type of accommodations need to be put forth in a 504 plan or an individual um, educational plan for the student. 
Regarding medications, um, we do require consent forms for medications, and we do require that each student has their own epinephrine outer injector. However, there was a new law passed recently and uh, signed by a governor on August 16th that um, epinephrine auto injectors will be kept in the schools, will be unlabeled, and will be there to be, um, will be used for any student that exhibits any signs of anaphylaxis. Wow, that's great. Yes, yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think all states should pass a law like that. Absolutely. So I'm very excited about that, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll see as far as what benefits will derive from this new law, but actually I think it'll save a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. so. Is there any legal aspects with nurses giving an unidentified epinephrine? Do you have a concern with that? I'm glad you asked that question, because with the Nurse Practice Act in Illinois, we are not allowed to administer medication that is not prescribed for an individual student. And with this new law, the medication is not prescribed for an individual student. It's just part of what we would call stock medications, and it could be used for anyone. And so I guess under the Good Samaritan law, this would be more so take effect, more so than the Nurse Practice Act. Okay. So, so in, in many states, um, it may not be the nurse who is legally allowed to administer an epinephrine auto injector to a child. It might have to be some other person in the school, right? That is a good point, and I agree with you 100%, unless there are some changes to the Illinois Nurse Practice Act. And one good plan of care or one good plan that the school administrator should have is to designate an individual in the school that will work with the child, who will be educated, who will learn the plan for the child, and will be there to initiate emergency response. Sometimes in an emergency, there's not uh, enough time yes. for uh, yeah. one to access that plan for a, a faculty member, perhaps, or, mm -hmm. or a member of the staff mm -hmm. who uh, isn't familiar with the particular child, but who may have to act to find that plan. Um, do schools have a general plan for emergencies that uh, would apply in all of those situations a and then, of course, as time permits, go to the individual plan. Yes, currently the food allergy management policy um, that was adopted by Chicago Public Schools on January 26th of this year incorporates three main components. The first component is early recognition and treatment of any signs and symptoms. Uh, the second component is education to the staff and members to teach them about the medication, how to inject the medication, and when it is appropriate to give the medication. And the th um, third component is emergency response. Each school is, is mandatory that they develop an emergency response plan, and this plan should include treatment for students with uh, allergies. One of the key issues that school principals face is how to deal with peanut-free tables or peanut-free zones. Christy, how would you handle this as a school principal? It's absolutely something that we have had to handle and address for many years. Um, the fallacy is that the only allergen is peanuts. That's absolutely not the case. And in fact, for each classroom of students who sit together, um, at their set of tables, we actually have an allergen-free zone. So between four and eight students can sit in that area with their classmates um, and be part of that community. And we found that that's really important, that they don't feel like they're separate or segregated. So they're integrated right with their own peers. Um, we actually have a tiered approach so that in the lunchroom, boys and girls can bring lunches of their choice. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the allergen-free area is kept allergen-free. And that's something that all of the supervisors and volunteers understand coming into our lunchroom. Mm -hmm. In the classrooms, however, boys and girls have one snack each day in full day kindergarten, first and second grade. And we really limit them to four choices. It can be yogurt, it can be cheese, it can be fruits or vegetables. And obviously, if a child has a dairy allergy, citrus, we'll modify that expectation with that specific classroom. In terms of the special treat, the birthday celebration, the holiday yes. party, mm -hmm. we ask that everything be in its original packaging with an ingredient list mm -hmm. attached. Um, boys and girls with allergies certainly always have their snack boxes available to them, um, but we try to make those accommodations so that all children can participate. We do, of course, in a K-2 building have 
curriculum related food activities yes. mm -hmm. and when we do some cooking in a classroom we give our parents um, about a week to ten days notice that that cooking experience is going to happen and we explain to them what the ingredients are, how we expect that it will play out and certainly parents of children with allergies sign off on the plan that they can fully participate or we work with them to accommodate so that we understand their level of participation. Let me pose a very controversial issue. Do you think that all the schools that have peanut free zones or peanut free schools made that decision based on science or emotion? Start. What do you think? <laughs> In my role as a principal, I will tell you, sitting at individual health care plan meetings, sitting across the table from parents who are obviously passionate about and worried about their children's health, it's hard not to want to do whatever those parents ask in order to keep their children safe. But again, I would say it seems that much is driven from emotion in this, yes. in this whole area. Yes. Um, yes. Because when you talk about the safety of children, there's nothing more important. Mm -hmm. You want those children to be healthy, to feel a part of the environment, and there is something that can really hurt right. them. And right. so it's hard not to just do everything like eliminate, and yet it's not realistic. So, and, and what's the science? Does it work? Monita? Well, I must confess that I disagree with the peanut-free zones or peanut-free school because I think that it's unfair to the unaffected students or the non-food allergic student. And then we come, because we're trying to be fair to the food allergic student, we're being somewhat unfair to the student that does not have a food allergy. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, it may lead us to a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. If you think that you have a peanut-free school or a peanut-free zone, there's a high probability that that really isn't the case, at least yes. not all the time, every yes. day, every school day. I mean, if you believe that, day. maybe you wouldn't even need to carry epinephrine. <laughs> you just and leave it home because it's a That wouldn't be a good idea home. at all. No, I think Dr. Cash is very uh, correct. He hit the nail on the head when there's a false sense of security. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I would say mm -hmm. I don't agree. As a school principal responsible for 500 students, I don't I don't agree with the peanut-free approach. Right. Um, you know, I think right. that the complacency mm -hmm. may come on the part of staff yes. to feel like this isn't something we have to worry about because this yes. allergen isn't right. around. Right. I think that's where the complacency might fall. Right. Um, however, you know, when we unroll our plan, mm -hmm. there's always the question, are you saying that my child can't bring peanut products he or she's a yes. vegetarian. Yes. Our ethnicity, yes. you know, requires that we yes. eat certain yes. foods. It opened doors for it, even more accommodations right. from other students. And right. before you know it, the whole school is out of control. Right. Well, but, <laughs> but you can make the argument that peanuts and tree nuts, peanuts alone account for approximately two thirds of anaphylaxis-related deaths. Mm -hmm. And peanuts and tree nuts together are over 90% of the anaphylaxis-related deaths. Mm -hmm. So there's a strong case to be made that you can have restrictions around those two mm -hmm. food allergens mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. starting down that slippery slope of other food allergens. Mm -hmm. I would never ask that dairy be restricted in, in a school. That would be mm -hmm. ridiculous. It's, mm -hmm. it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, there's a study that shows there's been some studies done that show when you affect a restriction on peanuts in a school, mm -hmm. it will reduce the amount of peanut protein, of the protein in that school by approximately 90%. It does however, not eliminate it. However, there's been studies to show that even in peanut-free schools, children will have reactions to peanuts in those schools. Well, sure. They, a they high can. Percent, a high percent. So you 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 don't really totally eliminate well, you the can't risk, eliminate it. Um, and it's usually their friend gave them something. Because again, we we talked earlier about the fact that skin contact is unlikely to create any serious reaction. Maybe some hives, I'll give you that, but there have not been any noted fatalities from contact with, and. 
again, usually it's the uh, peanut husk, it's the inhalation, mm -hmm. and there has to be excessive exposure for inhalation to have a problem. Let me play devil's advocate here, though. Uh, I believe that if we were <clears throat> making an evidence-based decision now, the limited evidence that we have suggests that peanut-free zones and peanut-free or, or uh, uh, well, allergen-free zones and schools uh, are not particularly effective. However, we also have to deal with the legal ramifications of what we do and what we don't do. And those many times are not the same. Uh, I wonder what the attorneys would say about uh, a school refusing to accede to a parent's request to limit exposure to allergens. Good question. Do you ever involve attorneys on the uh, <laughs> school safety development plan? And she looks at me. <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't as the school nurse, but the parent surely would get um, an attorney involved if, she, if the parent feels like the child's rights have been infringed upon. Mm -hmm. And the parent has every right to get a, an attorney involved. However, the accommodations in school need to correlate with the accommodations that are made at home in the physician's orders. And so, and those documents have to be reviewed by a school nurse and a team will determine the appropriate accommodations in the school setting. It's not about rights mm -hmm. and it's not about imposing your will on someone. It's about safety. Mm -hmm. And I understand you can't ever eliminate anything. You can reduce right. the risk. Mm -hmm. right. I want to reduce right. the risk for my child right. as much as possible. Right. There's no dairy allowed in my child's classroom. Mm -hmm. Obviously there is in the lunchroom. Mm -hmm. There's no peanuts allowed in my child's friend's classroom and there's a peanut table in the lunchroom. Mm -hmm. But they all have their auto their auto injectors available. Mm -hmm. they're, yes. they're readily and available. And that's the key, and that's is the key. being prepared that's to right. deal with an emergency because right. it's just like driving a car, there will always be accidents. Reduce the but risk. But if and you be can ready. reduce the mm -hmm. risk yes. and be ready, then yes. then you are prepared. And food allergies are not just all about peanuts and nuts. It's a right. wide variety. Sure. And we have to prepare those patients for all of those food allergies. Maybe we should think of uh, epinephrine auto injectors as being kind of like seat belts for cars and helmets for motorcycles. At this point, I would like to ask the panel to discuss what they consider good policies versus bad policies, and to include in that what's a good food action plan and what's a bad food action plan. As far as good policies and bad policies, first in general, I think that uh, we might want to conclude that good policies are those that have some scientific evidence base and that are based solidly on what we actually know rather than what we strongly believe, which may turn out to be not what we know. That's one thing. If you don't implement the policy effectively, or if it can't be implemented effectively because it's too expensive or just impossible to implement, then it's not going to be a good policy. Yeah, absolutely. And I would add, mm -hmm. I need a policy to be able to be made sense of. I need it written in language that I understand. And so, you know, I think that that's a real key piece mm -hmm. that we come to the table and really know what we're talking about. Absolutely. And in essence, a good policy is evidence-based whereas a bad policy is emotionally driven. Are you saying that when we come to the table, we need data that shows us what a child may need in particular? Well, uh, I think that evidence-based generally means uh, based on group data okay. that have been established scientifically. Now, that's different from what an individual child needs. Individual uh, children may not fit into the group process, may not be the same. Uh, Juanita was talking about the fact that uh, from a policy standpoint, we have to deal with uh, what's best for everyone, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't individualize right. so that we try to do what's sure. best for each individual. Right. But when, there, when an emergency comes, we have to have a plan that would work for everybody and that uh, all school personnel could implement. Mm -hmm. If yes. it's too complicated yes. or too individualized in an yes. emergency, mm -hmm. then it's not going to happen and that's mm -hmm. the second part of what I was right. arguing. It has to be simple. Yes. From yes. a medical perspective as well, 
when I see a patient, I need to establish, again, that there's a true food allergy there, that not only has that patient had a severe reaction from the food, but that I can identify which food it is. Just doing a bunch of skin testing or blood testing and coming up with a whole list doesn't mean that's what goes on the treatment plan. Mm -hmm. I only need to put on that um, right. food al action right. plan what they right. have reacted to and what right. they are at risk of having a serious reaction from. Yeah, if absolutely. I list everything, number one, no one's going to pay any attention to it. Mm -hmm. Number two, it doesn't have any meaning because Absolutely. we don't really know if that person would have a reaction or not because mm -hmm. either they have never tried it mm -hmm. or it's a false it's a false mm -hmm. reading and we don't want to deliver that message it is a very difficult question determining when to administer epinephrine mm -hmm. and that is an issue that we face all the time is it based on what could potentially happen to that child once mm -hmm. they start with symptoms is it based solely on what's happened the last time? We know that a previous reaction is no indication of how bad the next one's going to be. Mm -hmm. We know that a skin test response gives absolutely no parameters for how severe that person will have a reaction or mm -hmm. when that person is having less severe reactions as they grow older. Mm -hmm. So again, there is an issue there with evidence and we can only go so far. Dana, let me give you a perfect example. When we took my son in for testing, after he had his incident with the cookie at the park, right. the doctor came back and said, oh, he's allergic to peanuts, because he had scratched positive for peanuts, and he got a big welt. And I said, I laughed. I said, he's not allergic to peanuts. Because he eats it. He's been eating peanut butter sandwiches and peanuts for and that was right. since he since he's been a child and, and the doctor seemed surprised. He said, Really? I said, Yes. <laughs> and he said, Well then keep feeding it to him because you certainly don't want it to develop into a full blown and that's allergy. A very important point, and that is we cannot use a skin test to diagnose food allergy. It takes a history, a reliable history, consistent, and sensitivity or positive prick test. I'd like to now turn to our psychologist, Gene Cash. And I want him to tell us a little bit about what effect this has on the child and what he recommends that we do to have a wholesome, healthy mental attitude about food allergies. There are really critical challenges that kids face that we as adults need to understand. One of those challenges is the learning challenge. Kids who are food allergic have to learn things that other kids don't have to learn, a whole set of new rules for them. One, one set of rules is how to avoid the foods, how to recognize and to avoid the foods to which they're allergic. A second set of rules that they have to learn is what to do, what their role is in the case of emergency. And very often that includes how to utilize a, an epinephrine auto-injector. Mm -hmm. Then uh, they have to have good, uh, what psychologists call executive function, meaning that they have to be able to plan mm -hmm. and to control their impulses. Mm -hmm. There are many kids who are not good at that. They, they may not be good at it because they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or they may not be good at it because those executive functions just haven't developed or haven't matured yet yes. in those kids, and mm -hmm. that makes it particularly difficult for certain kids. You know, there's some kids who, at the same age level, have better executive functions and therefore better impulse control than others. A third thing that kids have to learn is that other people may not be consistently reliable in doing things for them. Other students may not be very kind to them or are very consistent in helping them to avoid foods. Even sometimes teachers and, and school personnel may not be consistently reliable and so they have to learn how to take personal responsibility for their own health care. There is one key issue that I would like for all of us to nail today before we leave, and that is epinephrine. When do we give it? How do we make the decision? How do we give it? And how much do we give? Who wants to be first? Well, I'll start. Uh, I often do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think that uh, most any school action plan should start with epinephrine. 
if you suspect an anaphylactic reaction. And here's the reason, my reasoning behind it. I know that there uh, are a lot of data that indicate that epinephrine administered early and often if necessary saves lives. We're either going to overtreat or undertreat. Which yes. is worse? Yes. Anita. I think that to undertreat is by far the worst thing that oh, anyone no can do. Uh, over treating, um, everyone knows that it, uh, um, epinephrine injections will not hurt the student even if they do not need it but however if you do not give them the medication they, they could lose their lives as Dr. Cash said and I just want to uh, reiterate that the early recognition is the key and the first line of medication should be epinephrine. I'm not sure that everyone really understands that epinephrine isn't a danger. Yes. Um, I think there is a misconception perhaps yes. for all of us not yes. in the medical field yes. that you know we could perhaps hurt a child yes. and I think getting that message out to our schools and to mm -hmm. our staff who may be the ones on those front lines administering that it is better to over treat. And there is absolutely never any contraindication to give epinephrine for anaphylaxis. Let me even be provocative to say that if your physician feels that for that particular food allergen your child is at risk of death, anaphylaxis, mm -hmm. and prescribes an epinephrine, mm -hmm. should he just omit the word Benadryl from any treatment plan? Mm -hmm. Because are we really interested in a few hives or itching? Would that be mm -hmm. life-threatening? Would that be so terrible if we didn't treat it? Mm -hmm. So maybe we should redefine what we really need to address, which is life-threatening reactions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And forget the minor ones where, mm -hmm. because the problem is the confusion that comes in. Yes. We yes. are teaching our uh, school personnel that when a child who has a food allergy ha is suspected or known to have accidentally ingested that food and then develops hives, they don't recall if that particular child almost died or if they've only had hives. Right. So right. we're sending a mixed message if right. we say this child gets right. Benadryl, that this that's child right. with the same reaction gets epinephrine. Yes. Right. And that's where yes. the problem comes in. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe we shouldn't treat allergic reactions that are not anaphylactic at school. Well, we, sometimes it's very difficult for school personnel to make that distinction. Right. If it's a school nurse, right. they may be able to make that distinction. Sure. Right. Other school personnel may not. Right. Is it better or worse to make a parent angry because they feel that their child was over-treated right. or right. to make a parent devastated because their child died of an anaphylactic reaction that was undertreated. Right. But from a nurse's position, if the nurse is with the student at the time or with the child and is treating the child, it is the nurse's responsibility to make that call um, and to make a decision and the parent is not physically present and the nurse has a license. So I think the parent has to really um, respect and then also trust the nurse's decision and the, the plan of care that the nurse and the parent have uh, developed for that child. I and totally again, and again, mm -hmm. the, you know, the nurse isn't always at school. Yes. Right. So then right. the, yes. the teacher has to make the decision. Yes. Y'all yes. are creating a lot of conflict inside yes. of me because mm -hmm. with my daughter with a moderate uh, dairy allergy okay. is probably right. going to be the one being the overtreated. Yes. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Is that bad? It, that's what's creating the conflict. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a catch it, it causes it is. a dilemma. It really does. And one closing mm -hmm. comment we have to remember: one may not be enough. Uh, auto injectors go yes. in pairs for yes. a reason. Yes. They need to always be kept in pairs. Mm -hmm. Thirty-five percent of the time, you will need a second dose. And if an accident happens and you you drop it, you misuse it, you've got a spare. So the take-home message is that food allergic reactions in schools may be serious and unpredictable, but treatment is not. If you educate first responders, teachers, principals, staff, and students on how and when to use an epinephrine auto-injector, virtually all deaths from anaphylaxis can be prevented. In some ways, it's as simple as that. Thank you everyone for tuning in to the Food Allergies and Anaphylaxis at School, Real World Solutions. And now back to Tori and Barber. Every school year, students die because they were unable to get to their asthma 
or anaphylaxis medications on time. The medications were locked in a nurse's cabinet or stowed away in a place too far to get to when the student needed them. Every second counts when asthma or anaphylaxis strikes. Help support Breathe It's the Law, a national campaign to make sure students in every state can carry and self-administer their life-saving anaphylaxis and asthma medications. For more information, visit breatheatschool.org or contact anma.org. I'm Torian Barber. See you at the next ACE broadcast.